describe me better than I describe myself. Um, can you hear me? Good. Okay, uh, Impress keeps wanting to put this slide up, but this is me. Uh, my name is Quinones, in case you were wondering. Uh, you do actually a very good job of not butchering it. Hmm? That's what somebody says to me. Um, so that's my uh, contact information and the joined in link for this talk if you uh, want to give me awesome feedback or crappy feedback. Um, been doing this since uh, about 1997. Um, the, the first 12 years of my career or so were in financial services, and then I moved into um, doing kind of network security work. And uh, more recently, I've been doing uh, media publishing. But my entire career has basically been a lot of high availability, high scale uh, kind of application design. So um, over the last few years, we've had this opportunity at Politico. Is everybody familiar with Politico? Okay. Um, to uh, completely redesign uh, our, our application stack. The site was first brought up around 2007, and it was written in ColdFusion. Um, it was written in ColdFusion in six weeks by one person, so I'm sure that you can, sorry, that you can imagine um, that it's an interesting code base. Um, a couple of years ago, they realized that they needed to pay back that technical debt, and they embarked on this process of moving um, not just out of self-hosted hardware at the Politico data center into the cloud and uh, to get rid of cold fusion and move into PHP. So that's when I joined uh, Politico to help facilitate that. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges that we faced, uh, that we continue to face as we're making this transition to um, a more scalable architecture. So... Um, we're going to try and answer some questions. What, what is a service architecture? Um, in a way, how does it relate and differ to service-oriented architectures, which is a very similar but not, uh, not exact uh, same idea? And why scale matters and why precision matters? Um, so we'll start with the basic question, what is a scalable application? What are we saying about an, a system when we call it scalable? An application is scalable when the response time um, overall is experienced by a user of the application remains consistent without regard to the number of users that are accessing that system at a given time. Um, to put it simply, traffic is not a factor uh, in response time. It can be very, very hard to get this right. And it's important to note that scalability and good performance are not necessarily the same thing. It's perfectly reasonable to say that an application that performs just as badly for 10 users um, as it does for 10,000 users scales well, um, claiming that might get you fired, but pedantically you'd be correct. Um, but it, you know, it's a tricky problem. Um, on the internet, predicting the amount of traffic uh, that a service is going to get is something we can only do to a very limited extent. A website that usually receives almost no traffic is just one bad link away from getting slammed. So we have to be balanced, uh, balanced pre being prepared for very high load with managing infrastructure costs. Um, everybody remember Slashdot? Now it's Reddit. For us in, the, in um, journalism, Huffington Post kills us. Um, the Drudge Report, believe it or not, just slams us from time to time. And in our particular domain, just like every other domain, there are, are uncontrolled variables that are, that are related specifically to your business. Do you know who these two guys are? Probably the one on the right, you know, for sure. Uh, he's an a indiscreet tweeter. The other guy's David Wildstein. He's in, involved in this whole bridge scandal in New Jersey. Um, so when, when stuff like this happens, political uh, people that move in that political space for us they're a little bit weird, and they do weird things, and it becomes a huge uh, news feeding frenzy. And for us in the IT department, that translates into um, sudden, unpredictable traffic spikes. It's really hard to know what's going to pop up next in the news cycle. Um, you can imagine that uh, being a political website, we expect a lot of traffic on election night. Um, in this most recent election in 2012, we expected to see our traffic double over the course of election day. And when I say double, I mean double over what had been a very high level of traffic for the preceding three or four months. Um, this is kind of what we had planned out. 
It's a pretty respectable bump. Um, this was what we considered our worst case scenario. Um, there were a lot of late nights, I don't want to tell you how many late nights, uh, that went into making sure that we could handle this. Uh, come election night though, this is what our traffic looked like. Um, there was a variable here, I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh, it, it's just numbers, um, it's, it's not uh, really relevant. Um, yeah, uh, there was a variable here that we didn't control very well. Um, we actually hadn't even considered it. Um, instead of our traffic doubling, it increased by about 30 times uh, over the course of the night. Uh, and, and actually, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's kind of a meta thing. When you, when, you, when you think about systems, and especially as developers, we think about our, our systems that we design and build, but the world is made up of systems that, they're, that are very organic. And the news media is a system. When one part of it gets sick, other parts have to pick up the load. So um, can you guess what that, that variable we didn't control well for was? No, actually. It was our competition. Um, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon on election day, Fox News' website went down. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Washington Post went down after them, then NBC and CBS. Um, as each of those sites became less and less responsive, the sites that remained up had to pick up more and more of the load. Um, by, the, by, the, uh, by the time everything was said and done, between 11 and 12 on election night, we handled more traffic uh, than we had previously handled on any single complete day since the site had launched. Uh, that, was, that was one hour, yeah. We, um, we served 54 million page requests, um, which was about our average monthly traffic uh, over the course of 2012. Um, it, was, it, was, it was pretty balla. I mean, it was, that, we had 725,000 peak concurrent con, uh, con connections. Our typical was around 20,000. Uh, we had planned for about 50. Um, so, yeah, it was a big day. Thankfully, we didn't fall over. Um, but we didn't fall over because we have some really, really, really great DevOps guys um, who were amazing and very responsive and started moving stuff into S3 really, really quickly. Um, it cost us a lot of heartache and really kind of forced us to re-examine um, everything we'd done to that point. So my question is, how do you plan for this? Or more importantly, how do you plan for this without going broke? Because you can, you can plan for this. I mean, you can build out servers until, until they shut the lights off, but um, how do you do this in a reasonable way that's not going to kill your business? And the fact is, you can't. You, you, you don't do it. Um, there are always going to be uncontrolled variables. Um, traffic is something that you usually cannot control at all. And it's something that can be factored out if you design your applications correctly. Rather than fighting traffic, we can accept it and we can find inner peace. Remember when I said that scalable application is one in which traffic is not a factor of response time. Ideally, as the number of requests that our applications handle every second increases towards infinity, we shouldn't see an appreciable change in the average response time to each request. Um, in the past, it's been, our, it's been typical to run our applications on iron that sits in the basement, which is what we've done at Politico, um, or maybe to have your applications hosted in a co-location center. Um, but this kind of puts an upper limit on how well we can uh, make our applications kind of live up to that, that traffic agnostic ideal. Um, hardware just costs money to acquire and install, configure, maintain, costs money to keep the lights on, um, keep the air conditioners running, costs money when a cleaning person knocks over a rack. Um, it, and it's possible to keep throwing hardware at the problem, but the, the costs sign it kind of compound. And, and um, I, I used to work at a little company that you might have called, heard of called Visa. Um, they ran out of data center space. They, they, filled, they had a whole four-story building that was just raised floor, um, and they filled it to the point that the fire marshal said, you can't put any more servers inside here. Um, so they ended up building an even bigger data center um, way out in the middle of nowhere in Virginia um, and, and started filling that up. So, um, you know, even for a company that basically has unlimited resources, um, 
the, the cost continued to compound. The problem is, for us at least, and I'm going to encourage you, um, even as developers or, or DevOps people, to think, um, to think with the minds of the business and, and understand where you can increase the business's value. Um, oftentimes, IT is seen as a black hole of money. Um, if you work in a development-heavy shop, we're usually the, among the most ex expensive non-executive employees on the payroll. Um, and we're, we're annoying and finicky, and we always want new computers every year, and, and we're just kind of a pain to manage. Um, companies realize they can't have no internet presence. Uh, more and more companies are an internet presence, um, so we're a necessary evil, but we're an evil nonetheless. So um, looking at these, these approaches that we've taken, we can either, either scale ahead of the problem, and that is uh, basically having hardware sit idle. Uh, you know, using electricity and costing money, vomiting carbon into the atmosphere. That's not a political opinion. Um, but this wastes money, wastes time. Um, or we can scale behind growth, which unfortunately is how we often do this. We, we kind of wait until we've reached our capacity and then build out more. Um, this makes a really bad experience for the user. And it makes a really bad experience for us because PagerDuty calls us all the time, which is annoying. And, and in the end, um, we ended up saving all that much money. As developers, though, we've put together a really nice toolbox over the years. and helps us make the most out of the hardware that our software is sitting on. We, um, we distribute load across multiple database instances. Um, we use caching um, to try and distribute and amortize the cost of computation over a larger number of requests. Um, and we have some, some really nice uh, tools in the form of frameworks, libraries, um, Composer, which I think any PHP developer can agree has changed this language in the what, two years since we've, we've had it. Um, I, you know, I've, for the last few years in my career before Politico, I was primarily a Python developer, Composer, I'll give a lot of credit for bringing me back to the language after being away from it for a number of years. Um, building applications in this way by reusing, reusing components and um, reusing open components that are, that are often scrutinized for security reasons, for performance reasons, um, really lets us make applications that are more portable and more manageable, um, that are more performant generally. Um, and then the development of, of cloud computing platforms over the last couple of years have really started to fill in the gap. And I, I think it gets a lot of uh, bad, bad feeling as kind of a, a buzzwordy thing. And in a lot of companies, it is, is a buzzword. But um, by this, this whole idea of distributed virtualized computing um, dramatically reduces the time that we need to scale out um, an infrastructure that our application is going to be running on. Um, and if it's done right, it can reduce the cost a lot. Uh, th that doesn't mean that the answer to scaling is to throw lots and lots of EC2 instances at a problem. It's not going to buy you much more than the old solution of putting more and more uh, servers in the server closet um, did. If anything, it's actually a little bit more important when we're running in, a, in this kind of environment to make sure that our applications are operating efficiently. Um, I stole this graph from Microsoft. Um, and it's an examination of kind of the mainframes, which is the ancient world where I got my start as a programmer. Um, client server, which in their terminology kind of represents the, the traditional, um, you know, hardware in the basement kind of applications and then cloud applications. Um, you can see that the cl cloud options do have a much, much lower entry point and the curve is much, much smoother. But um, it does curve up. It does curve up a lot, and it curves up quickly. And at a significant scale, things get very, very, very expensive. Um, I, I, I would love to be able to share with you um, the number at the bottom of our Amazon bill every month. It's, um, if I had that kind of money, we'd be listening to this talk on a boat. It's, it's, it's a lot. Um, it, so if we're not using these tools efficiently, uh, any cost savings we get there at the front, we can wipe out with usage fees at the back. 
And the fact is that new methods require new methods. We have this, this, new, this new way of delivering applications, of delivering services. And um, even if that doesn't result in a new method, it, it requires us to think about how we're developing and deploying applications. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, that sounded wonderful. <laughs> in a complex application, um, some of our components are going to be doing uh, a lot more work than others. Um, some operations are more expensive than others. We, I mean, we all know this. I.O. is expensive. Memory operations are cheaper. That's why we put everything in the universe inside in memcached. Um, so understanding what each of those operations costs, and I mean this at a pretty high level because, again, this isn't about performance. Obviously, you want to build applications that are highly performant um, and, and well-optimized, but just kind of understanding at a very high level what these operations are, how much they cost, um, is really key if we're going to leverage these kind of cloud platforms successfully. Um, so I'm going to go backwards a little bit to the 80s and 90s and talk about service-oriented architecture, which is kind of the, the granddaddy or granduncle of modern service app architecture applications. Um, so in the 80s and 90s, um, there was this move away from componentized software architectures uh, towards um, what was called the service-oriented architecture. Um, anybody work with, ever work with Corba or Genie back in the day? Okay. Um, it sucked. Sorry. It's terrible. Um, Corba came out around 1991, and it was an example of a framework of sorts for building service-oriented architectures. Um, this all came out of like the enterprise software world. Um, it's also where we get wonderful things like SOAP, and Wizzles, if you've ever had to work with, you probably hate your life. A lot of these technologies, like Corba and Soap, um, have gotten a rep as not being particularly fun to work with. I think that's a reputation that they've earned. Um, they're horrible. Maybe they made more sense in um, in the, the bullpens at Microsoft in 1993. Um, they, they don't work in the world today very well. But you have to understand the, the world that these guys were, were developing software in. Um, where there were standards, they weren't particularly well adopted. Um, network speeds were slow. The networks themselves were often very unreliable. Um, a lot of the network was done over dial-up connections. Um, the argument over text-based line protocols and binary, op binary protocols was actually like a real argument that people didn't uh, roll their eyes at. They argued about it on Usenet at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, it was a good idea. It was implemented horrifically. But, but service-oriented architectures were, were a pretty good idea. It was a solid idea that really represented um, an architectural evolution uh, from, from these kind of older monolithic systems towards systems that were a lot less tightly coupled, a lot cheaper to maintain and extend. So um, in that context, when we talk about a service architecture, um, what, do, what do we mean by a service? A service is a discrete and fully self-sufficient application that performs uh, one function or some small number of very closely related functions. So if you have a mailer service, it sends email. If you have an authentication service, it validates credentials. Um, the more granular that we make our services, the easier it is to reuse them. When we start bloating services up with more and more features, um, they stop fitting into those little keyholes um, of need. And um, we all have that kind of not created here mentality. And when things don't exactly fit what we want, we just make it ourselves. So we want to avoid that as much as we can because it's expensive. Um, a service is, is an interface that implements a contract, just like an interface in your code does. Um, you're specifying a set of legal inputs and outputs. That's really, really the, really it. Um, like any contract-based design, this makes it uh, very, very easy to test, especially if you're using cool things like Guzzle um, to write service descriptions. You can easily mock out uh, services for your, your service clients. Um, or even as you, you develop new and better versions or change the back-end implementation of services, um, it's very easy to do because the interface itself doesn't change over time. Services um, are loosely coupled. And, and it's very similar to the concept that we have in our code where, where 
you want to have as, as little information leaking between uh, services as possible. It's harder and easier in the context of discrete services uh, than when you're talking about maybe two different classes in an application. Um, the dependencies, it's easier to avoid dependencies, but when you do include dependencies, they get a lot messier between services. So a, a well-designed service, um, it doesn't know anything about anything outside of its realm. It may know that there's a service out there that exists, um, a storage service, where if I want to store data into a data store, there's a storage service I can call, pass it a JSON object or an XML document, and it'll store it somewhere. But um, it, it doesn't know anything about that implementation. And a service abstracts a small coherent set of application logic. Um, the consumers of the service shouldn't be aware of the service's implementation details, and, and that gives us a lot of flexibility. We can dramatically alter the implementation of a service uh, without any impact to its consumers. So, so let's say that we have a service that does a lot of, um, a lot of cryptographic work, and it's very, very expensive, and we, we decide that instead of a PHP implementation, uh, we want to re-implement it in C. And this is, this is actually something that, uh, not, at the, not at Politico, but at a previous, um, at a previous company that we, we ran into. Um, we had actually a PHP implementation of, of AES, which worked very well, but was incredibly slow. And, and as, um, as we started getting more and more traffic to it, uh, it was becoming a real choke point. So we re-implemented it in C, and massively increase the performance, um, but, but the, C, the C version still fulfilled, fulfilled that same contract, so we didn't have to change any code anywhere else in the application to make things continue to work. Um, discoverability, and it, it, there's, probably, there's a lot of really good like REST talks at this conference, so if you had a chance or have a chance to go to any of them, um, you should. Discoverability is, like, is really one of the, the difficult things um, to accomplish, but the, the idea here is that a consumer should be able to learn what it needs to know about a service by, by just by interacting with it. This is kind of the purpose behind WSDLs and um, those REST service, this REST application definition language. I don't know if that has an acronym. acronym. Um, and, and a lot of, you know, since a lot of these modern day web services are built as RESTful APIs and they're following the hate OAS principle, um, it, it's, um, it's gotten better. It's definitely not where it needs to be, um, especially because it's very hard to do this in, in JSON. JSON doesn't have a native, method, a native um, method for offering links to related objects. So um, unless you're following one of the new standards like HAL, which is kind of growing, in some, growing some acceptance lately, um, it's very hard to have like a universal way that an application knows when I'm interacting with a REST style API, what are, the, what are the links to other related hypermedia? Um, services are also stateless, and they're just concerned with inputs and outputs. Um, a request that's made to a service with some set of parameters should almost always result in the exact same response. Now, obviously, there are, there are explicitly non-idempotent operations that aren't going to result in the same result over and over, but for the most part, um, the output of a service should be cacheable. Um, once we ask for something, we can save the answer for later. And services are, are portable. And this is so important in, the, in cloud implementations because servers go up and, and down a lot. Um, I see a lot of people approach the Amazon cloud specifically, or EC2, as, well, it's just like a regular server, but it lives in the cloud. E EC2 instances crash. They go away, they do weird things. Um, and when they come back up, it's not the same server. Um, you can snapshot servers and, and bring them up later, but it's, it's, it's tricky to think of these things as real servers. They're platforms, they're, they're, they're abstractions of, a, of a, a Unix or a Windows operating system that just kind of live in this temporal fog where they come and go as they're needed. So building services that are portable, that don't have any reliance on where they live in the network is vital to make this work. And lastly, services are composable. And what I mean by that is that you can take individual services and build them into an application with a minimal amount of 
glue between them. Um, this, we started seeing real examples of this in the wild when mashups were really popular a few years ago. Um, our application that, that we've been building at Politico is um, the actual application itself that users interact with is very, very tiny. Um, the service network behind it is gigantic. But the application itself is really just this very thin coding that glues together the output of 20 or 30 different independent services. So um, just like you kind of compose libraries together to build an application, you can then take these mini applications and compose them into something more and more complicated. So in a sense, SOA was a good idea that came well before its time. Service-oriented architectures rely on a kind of distributed infrastructure that really didn't exist outside of enterprise um, until very recently. Uh, I mentioned I worked at Visa. They obviously had huge infrastructure in terms of servers and network, um, seven global data centers and all this kind of nonsense. But if you weren't working in an environment like that, um, large networks weren't all that common. Certainly geographically distributed networks were not all that common. Um, so by essentially um, shifting an application's messaging out onto the network, you kind of need um, a network infrastructure with enough speed and reliability to, to take on that load. And uh, you know, I'm not going not, not, not to gild the lily, but service architectures uh, have a lot of network overhead. All of this stuff is being sent in, um, you know, this is you know, this is all line protocols. It's it's there's not a lot of um, even with compression. There's a lot of, of overhead involved in all of this messaging. What would maybe happen in memory is now happening over a network connection. Um, designing applications like this outside of those large enterprises didn't make a lot of sense. Technology had to catch up, and then when technology ca caught up, it had to find better ways of doing it because what the enterprise world came up with was stuff like Corba. Um, I don't I don't mean to poop on Corba and Ginny. They were they were okay. 20, 25 years ago. Um, but they, they were trying to solve that discoverability problem that we talked about. And like I said, it's really a hard nut to crack. Um, they do a fairly good job of it. I mean, if you ever have the opportunity to, to, to work with them, which you probably won't because they're dead technology for the most part. But um, they did a fairly good job at this. But you can make the argument that they added a lot more complexity than they relieved. And certainly, developers were not keen on the learning curve that they required. And the implementations were really limited. There weren't implementations of these things for every platform, for every language. Um, so you ended up with applications that were tied very tightly to one of a few different platforms. But it turns out that the power to do this right was inside of us all along. Because HTTP and REST are service-oriented, these concepts—these um, concepts are so tightly interrelated um, that I, I kind of, when I when I go through this this talk, I kind of sometimes forget. Am I, am I talking about REST APIs? Am I talking about SOA? These are are, are concepts that exist inside of and because of each other. Um, so HTTP, as you know, is a really simple line protocol. It has what nine. Um, commands, get, put, post, patch, delete, trace, connect, options, and head. Um, three of those are, are very rarely ever used. Um, and, and it's an open standard. It's, it's an ideal glue protocol. Um, I, I dare you to name, I won't say one, but five platforms that don't support HTTP in some way, shape, or form. I've seen HTTP servers written in corn shell. I've seen that in production. Scary. There are lots of architectural patterns in use today, but for web applications, MVC is predominant. So, um, to, to kind of look at, at what, what a service oriented application looks like, um, I want to look at something that's a little bit more familiar, um, which is an MVC application. This is a pretty traditional, modern PHP application. Um, and let's just pretend this is a really good application. This was developed by someone who really cares about good engineering. They go to awesome PHP conferences and read PHP Architect and uh, argue on Twitter about stuff all the time. Um, 
we have a good separation of concerns. Presentation logic is mostly offloaded into the browser, or it's cheap. And uh, the data storage layer is nicely abstracted. Maybe there's doctrine in there, if you don't hate doctrine. Um, and this is an application that scales fairly well. We can copy this server to 10, 10 servers or to 10,000 servers, put them all behind some kind of load balancing infrastructure, and we can keep handling requests and be confident that we can handle the load. But there's a problem. Chances are the majority of the functionality implemented in our application is computationally pretty cheap. Since we're replicating the entire application um, from server to server, each, each installation must essentially be autonomous. Um, if we require a, a large EC2 instance um, to run this application, then we need a large instance for each and every copy of it. Um, that can get monstrously expensive. Um, so by approaching this from a service-oriented standpoint, uh, we have an application that's still pretty recognizable. So we have a user service which handles stuff like validating credentials, managing end user profiles. We have an, an email service which takes care of sending email out. Um, we've got a storage service which handles saving and retrieving data. And all of this is behind a relatively fr thin front-end application. Um, at a pretty high level, this looks kind of like our our architecture at Politico, not exactly the same. Um, there are a few infrastructure features that we need to make this work, though. And, and since we're adding so much messaging overhead, it's really vital that we have some kind of caching. And um, it doesn't really matter what you use to accomplish this. Memcached and Redis are great. Um, but I'm going to kind of sidetrack. And I promised myself a couple of slides to this, because I could actually talk about this for two hours. <laughs> Um, we use Varnish as an intermediary, inter intermediary layer in front of all of our services. So I'm going to sidetrack and talk about Varnish for a minute. Um, anybody uh, familiar with Varnish? A couple people, okay. Varnish is a caching reverse proxy. So if you've ever used anything like Squid, um, that's what Varnish is. Um, in, in our environment at Politico, if I had to call out one tool, um, as being vital to our, our success, it's, it's Varnish. Um, Varnish is, is really neat. It's, can, it's, it has a, a domain-specific language called VCL that lets you do some pretty impressive configurations. And it, it lets you hook into the um, request and response cycle basically at any point. Um, and it has a couple of interesting things called like saint mode and grace mode, which handle, handle things like um, if you have an, a cache object that's expiring, but the origin is not available, do you expire the cache and start serving the error, or do you continue extending the life of that object until the origin becomes available? Uh, grace mode, which helps with things like the stampede problem, so you have an, a popular object in the cache and it expires, and suddenly you have a ton of requests hitting the origin all at once for that object. Um, so these, these special behaviors that are, are somewhat unique to Varnish, um, Let's just kind of specify how we want it to behave when that origin server responds weirdly. Um, and, and these modes, ability, when you couple them with the ability to control things with standard cache control headers, means that we've basically been able to offload almost all of our error handling logic and um, almost all of that error handling logic into Varnish. Um, so like imagine if we have a Twitter service, right? Um, obviously, by abstracting Twitter's API behind an interface, we protect against like, external changes to that interface. But what happens when Twitter's unavailable? Which doesn't happen as, used, as much as it used to, but happens from time to time. Or when you exceed your, um, your request limit and you start getting those 420 s slow your roll whatever messages. Um, huh? Enhance your calm. There you go. Um, so the service can simply respond with an error code, and, and ours literally does it things in returns a 502 gateway unavailable or whatever. Um, and Varnish then just extends the TTL of that cache object for another five minutes. Um, our application itself doesn't ever have to concern itself with handling error conditions from Twitter or any outside provider, because um, our Twitter services contract guarantees that it will always return something that 
other parts of the application can work with. So this is just a, a brief detour into something that's not entirely related, but this is a technology that's really, um, it's really changed the way that we write, we write, we write code at, at uh, Politico, and it's really starting to change the way a lot of people are, are um, building big applications. So if you have some time, uh, it's an open source, uh, open source tool, so do take the time and, and take a look at it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, language agnosticism, and uh, I think lately it's been a banner banner couple weeks for PHP drama uh, with all the talk about framework agnosticism, um, the blow up between Phil Sturgeon and Taylor Otwell about you guys know Laravel and, and the Laravel packages. Uh, I think somebody made a good point that Symphony is a much better, much worse offender at that, which I agree with. Um, but this is not an idea that, that a lot of people disagree with. You know, we, we want to build things that work together. We want to build modules that can be reused and that can be, um, that can be shared even across different platforms. Um, because a more reusable code is, is better for the entire community. It saves us all time, which means it saves us all money. It makes it cheaper over the long run to build an application in PHP if we have this rich ecosystem of, of um, applications. But if you can extract that and, and move out to a level of language agnosticism, you can see that because we know that some languages are better at certain problems than, than other languages, um, why shackle ourselves to a single implementation language? Uh, write, why write things in PHP that should be written in Node.js or in Python? Um, if you want my personal opinion, I, I think that if you're an engineer and you only know one language, um, you're just doing yourself a, um, you're not doing yourself any favors. Um, even if you never use another language other than your primary language in your work, um, learning how to work in JavaScript or in Python will change the way you think about approaching problems. It'll just make you a better developer. So that's the end of my, my sidetrack. The point to take away from this, though, is that um, in our architecture, uh, we're not married to a single language. So let's say we want to add a, a scheduling service to our application that we were talking about before. Um, this is a really simple service. It's going to have a post, an endpoint job. You can post a job to it. It'll return an ID, and you can get that ID to look at the status of it. Um, the language doesn't really matter. Uh, like I said, we can write this in Python, we can write it in Node.js. The beauty of this architecture is that we have that flexibility to target at very, very specific low-level points, um, solving one small problem with the right language. Um, this isn't a joke. We actually have something written in Turbo Pascal. It's in production, yeah, right now. Um, we have a, we, not our political website, we actually manage another website for our company, and uh, it's a local news station, and the, um, the weather feeds are generated out of a service written in Turbo Pascal. It's pretty pimp. Um, but when we do get around to changing this, it's the nice thing to know, is that um, we don't need to change any code anywhere else in the entire application to make this work we can kind of cut that Pascal back end out because it's behind an interface. Um, we don't have to be concerned about uh, issues propagating further up into the application. Um, that said, being PHP developers, um, you know, you may like Drupal or, you probably don't like Drupal, you may like um, <laughs> trying to, I, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, Whatever, whatever, you th whatever you think of as, as PHP's killer app. Um, in my opinion, WrestleWeb web services are PHP's killer app. Um, there is no language that's more portable than PHP, and I don't care what people tell you about uh, Node.js or, you know, well, no one calls Python particularly portable. It's hard to say. Um, PHP is the only language where you can throw some scripts up on a server and, and have them work. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the, the meat of it. Um, and it marries so seamlessly with HTTP um, that uh, even if you're not using a framework, which, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever floats your boat, um, you have this very easy access to the requests and um, to modify the responses. So 
it's almost kind of difficult to believe that PHP wasn't created specifically for this, this problem domain. Obviously, it, it wasn't because PHP predate, predates this by a few years, but um, PHP also wants to be stateless. Um, a lot of the problems that we get into with PHP is when we try to make it do things where it, it has to manage state over a long period of time. It's not very good at it. It's gotten better. Like it, it doesn't have like the memory leak issues that it had for, for so long. But um, long-running PHP processes are, are not anyone's idea of, of fun to work with. Um, so if we go back to our, our application, um, we can look at this from a network perspective. And it looks a lot simpler, because it is. Um, this would be a good example of what our, our development environment looks like, although we have everything in, you know, it's, everything is clustered out. So we have a, there's a minimum of two services at every servers at every layer. There's a, a front end application server, a services server, which has all these different services living on them. They can be just, you know, Apache vhost definitions that are pointing to different applications installed on a server. Um, and then a database cluster. So if, uh, like I mentioned before, this is an email application. So um, we send out tons and tons and tons of email. And um, that email service is, is our pig. It's, it's, just, it's just taking all the resources on that machine. So if we decide um, we want to give that service a little bit more breathing room, from a network perspective, all we have to do is bring up another service, stick the service on that machine, change a DNS entry, and um, the service is moved. Now, the other services are still know that they can talk to mail, mailservice.application.com and get to it. The fact that it's now living on a different virtual server doesn't change anything from a logical standpoint, although it can be, represent a pretty significant change in the way the application is performing on the network. Because in, in essence, the mail server is an abstraction. It's a host name. Um, it can be on a shared server. It can be on a dedicated server. It can be on a cluster of 100 servers. Um, the sum total uh, to moving it is just creating a virtual server, deploying the code, and changing a DNS entry. This is something that takes us about an hour. Um, it often happens when one of the DevOps guys will say, hey, such and such service is, is really kind of um, a pig when it gets hit hard. Is it OK to move it? And we in development will say, sure, go for it. And it's done. So, let me walk you through the request flow here. Um, this is... <coughs> This is uh, pretty much what, what we do at, at Politico. Um, the clients are, are requesting against a Varnish server that's public. And that's our only public facing address, is actually a Varnish server. Uh, and right behind that is an application server. So it's a front end application server that makes requests back to the services network. Um, a lot of the services return HTML, a lot of them return JSON objects. Um, it knows how to put them together and, and respond to the client with them. And then the front, the, in front of the services application server, there's another there's a service network varnish. So we have, excuse me, varnish at two places in the um, in the infrastructure. This gives us a lot of flexibility. So if we have a big news story, and a news story for us is pretty much just static content. It's a couple images that are hosted in a CDN anyway, and uh, a bunch of HTML. Well, we can bring up a, a billion varnish servers in front of everything. Everything in the back stays pretty much the same. Um, but on election night, we have the exact opposite problem. Most of the work is being done by these election data services. If, if anybody ever says, hey, we got a great job for you. We want you to parse um, election data feeds from the Associated Press, don't take that job. You, you, yeah, don't do it. Huh? Yeah, I know. It's horrible. Um, this, this, is, this is so complex and annoying, I, I, won't, I won't punish you with the details. Um, but we, we can do this. We can just we can move election data service onto its own cluster. It doesn't live there all the time, just when we have elections going on. Um, we can move it onto its own cluster. We can expand it out as big as we need it, since that's where the majority of this traffic is getting hit. Um, and um, it, it works very well. So we can, we can rearrange the important functional areas in our application um, to avoid having to turn things off when we get slam with traffic. 
this is a, a, what we call a fluid application, and it, it, it lets us respond in real time to changing conditions. Um, it's not a magic wand. Sudden spikes in traffic will always cause issues, but it, it cuts down on the mean time to recovery um, because we can quickly bring up more resources to fill in that gap. And because we can, we can leverage resources when and where we need them, we minimize the cost of handling those spikes. Um, and again, services can be turned off as a stopgap because Varnish will continue to um, respond with whatever it last saw from them or some information that the, uh, that the front end can, can work with. Um, key to all of this is instrumentation. Uh, everything in the application needs to be measured and profiled. Uh, we use Datadog and StatsD. Um, StatsD is a really cool thing that I think came out of Etsy. Um, and Datadog has their own implementation of it. Um, there's lots of tools. I think AppDynamics is here. They've got a really neat tool that does some of this kind of work. Um, so we're collecting all this information from the network side and the system side and application level. Um, and at, the, at a bare minimum, we're profiling every request to, so we can get a running average of response times. Um, anything else that we think of that we want to measure, we can also, but we can uh, record reliable performance trends. Um, this is a little snapshot. I think this is our APNS server. So it's, it's just handling push notifications out to, uh, to Apple. Uh, so we get this really pretty pictures like with graphs and things, and this will scream at us over pager duty if something is going really insane. Um, it's really cool. So we, have a deep, we get this deep understanding of what's going on in our application, and, and, we're work, and this is what we're working on right now, kind of turning, taking it to level ultimate. We're giving the application the power to self-provision. Um, when traffic spikes on our Varnish servers, we can let them provision themselves. They can bring up 10 more and 10 more. Um, we can do this because our deployment mechanism is also distributed, so there's no single point of deployment. Um, there are obviously limitations, uh, but for the most part, we can let this happen without waking somebody up in the middle of the night. Um, if some news breaks at 2 in the morning, there's a... Um, earthquake on the west coast you know, at 8 p.m. when most of the east coast has gone to bed um, and we have a huge traffic spike, uh, it's not going to kill anything, which is kind of nice. So um, to kind of sum up, you start to get this, this payoff from, uh, from precision. And again, this is an architectural pattern. It's just another tool in that toolbox, but it's a really important one. Um, a lot of us shy away from these questions of cost, and, and we shouldn't, because it's not only important to build good software, but to do it in a way that's efficient in terms of development time and infrastructure um, costs, because those are usually the largest lines in a company's budget. Um, having the ability to target individual chunks of code for intense optimization, even Reimplementation lets us focus our, our kind of scarce resources on the parts of our applications that really, really need it. Um, and some of the, the tools that I, I really think you should take, take time to look at, they're just here in case you want to link to them. Um, and that's me. So if, uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them.